Good evening. Good evening and welcome to Conversations. Well, we're very pleased to welcome to the program tonight Moorhead Kennedy. And Moorhead Kennedy has become known to many in the United States society and world society as having been one of the uh, hostages that were held in Iran. And he has uh, written a book, a very interesting book, called The Ayatollah in the Cathedral, which recounts many of the experiences of that experience itself and also talks a great deal to American foreign policy issues. And we're happy to welcome Mr. Kennedy uh, to the program this evening. Glad to see you. I wonder if you might, uh, Mr. Kennedy, share with us. You, you've had a unique uh, experience, been within the Foreign Service and so forth, and you have uh, you had a unique educational experience. I wonder if you could share a little of your own historical background and development, and then from that perspective we could talk about... Well, at that school, as a 15-year-old, I lost a debate on the subject of Palestine. Hmm. This was in 1946, before the creation of the State of Israel. And I lost my side of the debate, lost, on the question of whether or not Palestine should become a Jewish state. So I wrote to the Zionist organization, I wrote to the Arab office, and I got very interested in that question. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, as time passed, I went to Princeton, where I was the first freshman to be allowed to study Arabic, mm -hmm. and probably in the country. And then on, uh, did all my work in, in Arabic and Middle Eastern history at Princeton, that was of a major type. Mm -hmm. And then on to Harvard Law School, mm -hmm. where I uh, specialized in Islamic law, Interesting, yeah. And that was an interesting time. And mm -hmm. I, my thesis was on comparing the Islamic law of inheritance with that of Massachusetts. Oh, that's interesting. And there I, con right? I concluded that yeah. there were differences, but also and some uh, interesting similarities. But that I thought in terms of fulfilling its objectives, the Islamic system was a little better. Huh. And I think that that has been a mind set of mind for a long time, that it's not, it's important to remember uh, that out there, mm -hmm. they're different. In the, the world in general. In the world in general, mm -hmm. wherever they are, yes. they may be different from us and they may look funny and talk funny, mm -hmm. but there are people that have some occasionally some pretty good ideas. And it is extremely important, isn't it, that we be able to understand and to the degree possible put ourselves in the position of the others, as it were, uh, in, in broad philosophical terms, it's important that we all, yes. the nations, be able to do that. I know. Essentially, but, if in any negotiation, and we negotiate all the time mm -hmm. in this life, uh, you're asked to put yourself in the shoes of your boss if you're having a disagreement with him or of another colleague or of your wife or your or spouse. And yet, when it comes to foreign affairs, the last thing in the world an American is willing to do is to try to, is to think or to try to think what it would be like to be uh, a Soviet, to be, to be an Arab, to mm -hmm. be an Iranian, to be an Indian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the result is that we think of the world as a projection of ourselves and we think that others must be thinking along the lines we're thinking and when they don't we're troubled by it and the same thing works in reverse when we consistently fail to understand and indeed disregard the points of view the uh, interests of another society then a great deal of anger and resentment builds up sometimes it can lead to an open wars with Japan in 1941 and I remember particularly after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese ambassador in Washington said, you know, isn't it a tragedy that two nations, great nations, have to be so, can't settle this problem, their problems in a more mature fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think today, and this is part of the th thesis of my book, the uh, 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 elements in the Arab world and in Iran are reacting against us through another kind of war, a low intensity war called, called terrorism. Mm. And I think it is a way of trying to make us understand or at least be aware that they have a different point of view. We wouldn't be paying any attention to the Palestinians if the Palestinians weren't erupting from time to time, if hijacking planes. If it would have just gone away or yeah, something like that. The hope was, certainly yeah. on the part of Israel and on the part of a great many Americans, that uh, the Palestinian problem would just go away. Uh -huh. And it hasn't. Uh -huh. And they found a way to make us aware that they exist. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important thing that, yeah. that, for them. And from our perspective, it is important, and from your book, it, it comes back to it increasingly, that we be able to have this, uh, what, uh, 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 ability to put ourselves in the shoes of the other people or into the mind of the other people, to the degree we're able to do that both as citizens, individually, mm -hmm. and particularly important perhaps in terms of the institutions of our foreign policy, particularly the Foreign Service, and that we can become too parochially viewed, too nationally oriented perhaps. Of course and we can. This is a major problem in an era of 
such devastation and so forth that we find uh, ourselves. Of the, risk that we're, the risks that we're facing abroad. I think that, mis that the present administration has been enormously successful in responding to the American mood hmm. of today, and that's why I think uh, one of the secrets of Mr. Reagan's leadership. But I'm not sure that mood is always very enlightened. Hmm. And I'm not sure this administration, in terms of foreign affairs, compared to, say, to President Nixon's administration, compared to Republican administrations, is particularly enlightened. Mm -hmm. It seems sometimes as if they really don't want a foreign policy, as if they simply wish to uh, enunciate what America believes, uh, to negotiate as little as possible. Uh, when Mr. Reagan first came into office, uh, his positions on nuclear disarmament were said to be non-negotiable. Mm. Well, that, of course, reflects something very deep in the American character, that we're always right and the other guy's always wrong. Now, we know in ordinary life that's not the case. We know when we go to buy a used car that uh, the guy's asking too much and we're offering too little. Uh, and, that it, and it doesn't uh, bother us particularly that the haggling that's going to take place, or if you buy a house or whatever, is going to reflect a recognition that nobody's altogether right and altogether wrong, and therefore let's make a deal. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to foreign affairs, there's a very histrionic, very dramatic, very uh, hyperbolic approach to some of these issues. And I certainly think that, that terrorism, which is something I've experienced and therefore think I know something about, mm -hmm. has certainly brought these qualities out mm -hmm. uh, in spades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, you followed through, back again to the history of your academic development and so forth, you followed through with this early interest in the Islamic world and so right. forth with a uh, decision to enter into and become part of our foreign service system. Yes, and so forth. I did that without being necessarily a people person, which you have to be uh, to su survive in that uh, world, uh, I learned. Uh, you have to be someone who compromises because every government decision is a compromise. Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared to accept, uh, to support um, views and policies you may not yourself uh, 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 necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. I found it a very challenging career. I must say I would recommend to any young person, ma male or female, that they go into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as I grew older and began to have certain ideas of my own, uh, and you learn in the Foreign Service that that uh, you have to reach a very high level indeed, or maybe you, you never will be able to give effect to a lot of your ideas, that I'd be better off outside the Foreign Service. And I had this extraordinary thing happen to me. Yes, indeed. Uh, the being taken hostage, being very well publicized, partly because my wife was the spokesperson for the hostage families uh -huh, uh -huh. during my captivity. That, and when I left the Foreign Service, um, and found that I was quite good on my feet, that I, I, I knew how to speak in public. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that I had a chance to find platforms for a lot of ideas that most people don't uh, find in their lifetime, no matter what they do. Mm -hmm. you, you, the, the experience itself, you, you had been assigned to, uh, well, to Yemen, to Chile, right. to Lebanon, for right. a stint, and around. And then you finally were brought, I wonder if you could just share a little bit of that and then bring us up to the, brought you to Iran, and we could talk specifically about that. Well, yes, I started in the Yemen as an administrative officer, which is in those days where they started beginners, mm -hmm. because nobody really wanted to do administration. And of course, it's the hardest thing, particularly in the third world country, like the Yemen, mm -hmm. uh, when the generator breaks down, al generator or as, as he was called, mm -hmm. um, when that breaks down, I just look at it, and it would look at me, and I didn't know what to do. Yeah and uh, motor pools and things. All this was rather foreign to my experience. I'm not of a practical bent. Mm -hmm. So it was a very poor assignment. Uh, the fact that I had a certain amount of Arabic under my belt had really mm -hmm. very little to do with the generator. Yeah. So they trans... good for you. For, uh, having yes. Picked up Arabic. Yes, so I got, out of, I got out of that assignment. I was transferred to Athens, to Greece, which was part of the Middle East. Uh -huh. And we had a very interesting time because I was involved in the Cyprus crisis. Oh, yes as well as uh, in political military work. And this was a time when Greece was just beginning to feel its independence, its real independence, having been, you see, an aid recipient till 1962, when I got there that year. Mm -hmm. a Greece had been uh, flat on its back when we moved in in 1947. Yeah. Uh, and, in fact, American technicians were serving in Greek ministries because the Greeks, having gone to war in 41, hadn't had time 
to train up the people they needed to bring Greece into the post-war world. Well, about 1962, the Greeks had their own house in order again, and certainly they, uh, we weren't needed as much as we were before, and they, mm -hmm. they found ways to make us aware of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It wasn't terrorism, it wasn't, uh, but it was a good preparation for it. Mm -hmm. It was ways to needle us, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, they were very good at it. In fact, the uh, head of the American desk, uh, Alexander Xides, had an American wife, mm. so he understood Americans very well and knew just how to get us mad. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, compounding our problems there was the Cyprus crisis, mm -hmm. where both sides uh, saw its side, the Turks and the Greeks, as absolutely right, and the other side as absolutely without merit. That's the major all. problem that perhaps confronts us all as a human society now, as it comes out in your. How book. do we negotiate? How yeah. do we, how do we grant that perhaps somebody, might have a point of view mm -hmm. that's worth, uh, respecting? The Greeks said, "Well, Cyprus may have a Turkish minority, but the Greek." are in the majority, and mm. uh, we've got artifacts that are Greek going back to the beginning of time. How they knew they were Greek, nobody seems to know, but that's what they said. Mm. And the Turks had said, you know, we are people who believe in treaties. The Turks are very much, mm -hmm. very correct people. Mm -hmm. And they had a treaty called the Treaty of Lausanne after the Second World War, First World War, which um, uh, was the settlement that really lasted, mm -hmm. unlike the Versailles agreements and the rest. And the Treaty of Lausanne provided that essentially no groups of Turkish of islands off the Turkish coast would belong to more than one to uh, would belong to more than one country. Mm -hmm. So the British had one, Cyprus, and the Italians had some, the Dodecanese, Rhodes, and the Greeks had the rest. Mm -hmm. Well, when after the war, the Ita Italy lost out, and uh, the Greeks took over those islands. The Turks got apprehensive, and when finally Cyprus was about demanding independence to unite with Greece to have Ennesis with unification with Greece. Then the Turks uh, uh, said enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we know, the Turks finally invaded Cyprus mm -hmm. after my uh, involvement in, with that problem. Mm -hmm. And as a result, too, with this, I think it was a great failure of American diplomacy that we were somehow unable to bring these two sides together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I describe in my book, which I think would be of interest, is the way embassies get co-opted by the countries to which they're assigned. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, those of us in Athens, particularly those of us in the political side who knew a lot of Greeks, uh, were invited around. Uh, every Greek took the opportunity to remind us of the uh, eternal claim of Greece to Cyprus. So you become enmeshed in that atmosphere and you become a spokesman. You become a, a kind of a, a substitute or a surrogate for uh, the Greek government in reporting back to Washington. It's called localitis mm -hmm. in the Foreign yeah. Service. Mm -hmm. And over in Ankara, there was a lot of localitis too, but it was just the opposite, of course. Yeah, right. And I think that in the Battle of the Telegrams, which is how Foreign Service battles have fought out, internecine battles of that kind, uh, I think the uh, ambassador in Athens, uh, in wonderful man, uh, uh, Henry Labouisse, whom I greatly admired, but he wasn't quite as skilled with a telegram as his opposite number in Ankara, mm -hmm. who was Raymond Hare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as somebody said back at the ranch in, in the State Department, as we watched this battle go on, we mm -hmm. could see uh, Ankara's star beginning to rise and Athens beginning to fall. Mm -hmm. Now, the point I'm trying to make in the book is that the uh, this is not, this is a hell of a way to run, to run a railroad. Yeah, all right. uh, that uh, uh, hoping that if out of the clash of opposites will come a higher synthesis doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what happened was that we alienated uh, Greek public opinion in many ways, and we're paying for it. Yeah, right. and with, it, with Mr. Papandreou yeah. uh, as prime minister to this day. Yeah. And that gave you increased feeling for the, uh, the affairs that were in the Mediterranean and so forth? Well, it certainly was an education. Yeah. Now, I had taken the Ottoman history course at Princeton, which is a graduate course they let me take. So I knew something more than anybody else in the embassy yeah. in Athens about Turks, uh -huh. or at least Ottoman history. But, um, but I did learn something far more important, and that is that the truth doesn't necessarily emerge uh, from inter-embassy uh, or inter-agency, or in other words, within the U.S. government. Yeah. Uh, there, there seems often to be a lack of, of looking at a whole picture in a whole way and saying what are the 
What's the long-range interest of the United States? And this is and this is a this is a critique that could be given of let's say the Foreign Service, the United States Foreign well, Service, let's say and the whole, let's say the governmental apparatus, the whole governmental apparatus of the United States. And since we're talking about the United States in yeah, particular, uh, let me quickly say I think that in uh, the Foreign Service attracts the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. It's a marvelous group of people. Mm -hmm. I don't know any. Uh, I've thought it maybe at the faculty, the Harvard faculty, but I can't uh, imagine an abler group of people than. Are in those walls of Foggy Bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The system mm -hmm. doesn't permit the, that kind of as much talent as is there to give to be given full expression. That's and, part of the problem. Yeah, I see. That is part of the problem. And is the problem is is it is it is the problem increasing with time? Is it becoming well? Less I think there's a lot of in, new problems that are emerging. And yes. you've seen special problems out of your experience in Iran, particularly that that highlights that. Well, on several levels, I think that the present administration is not very sympathetic to the Foreign Service. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are demanding ideological conformity. They think there's such a thing as right wing or, or Republican Party foreign <coughs> policy, and there isn't really. Mm. Foreign policy is as objective a determination of American interests as you can determine, mm -hmm. and I don't think that that lends itself to this kind of ideological input. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result, as I think I mentioned, a lot of foreign service people feel that we don't really have much foreign policy left. It is just a restatement of American views. Foreign policy in the sense of interacting mm -hmm. with other countries. And that, of course, is a great depressant to the Foreign Service. And when you add to that the politic politicization that ambassadors are picked because of their political views and often from outside the service more than ever. And when on top of that, uh, the somehow for a lot of people, the fun has gone out of it. Mm. The Foreign Service is not respected as it used to, as it should be. Mm -hmm to the extent it should be, uh, for its expertise. And I think that uh, it, it lacks, therefore, this kind of self-confidence that true professionals ought to have. And I must say, occasionally the Foreign Service really blows it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they blew it yeah. when it came to Tehran and my own captivity, which, again, I recount at some length in my book. Yes, indeed. Because the point I'm trying to make in, in the is that Mr. Carter made a decision to admit the Shah to the United States for medical treatment, which itself was a phony. Mm. I mean, the man was sick, but he didn't need to come here for his illness, and he was trying to buy a house, as my wife discovered. Mm. Uh, up so in he, purchase. Up in purchase, and why? So he, we wasn't really uh, the kind of political refugee that uh, he laid, or, or health, or here for health reasons. Um, he was admitted without any renunciation of his uh, right to the throne, mm. without any renunciation effectively of any of his political claims. So it was quite understandable when the students who took us over were able to claim we are preempting by taking the embassy an effort by the United States to restore the Shah mm -hmm. uh, using the embassy as a base such as the United States did in 1953. And that is something that ought to have been able to, at least if they were going to go that course, that should have been able to be, in a certain sense, at least in a scenario sense, or in some sense, foreseen that such a reaction would occur in yes. Iran at the... Mr. Carter admitted in his, bio in his biography, he said that he'd asked some of his advisors, can you guarantee me that, that uh, uh, after I admit the Shah, the embassy won't be taken hostage? He does not record what the reply was. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I, he, I don't know who he's protecting. He's a very decent, nice man. But I don't think the scenario should have been embodied something else, and that's something that I feel badly about not having foreseen. I was reporting. I was out there doing some economic reporting and filling in for the regular head of the section. I was there, I should say, on temporary assignment. But I must say I was making the most of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I was pointing out was the disillusionment of a great many in the business community with the revolution. And one banker saying to me, I am not about uh, to do the revolution any favors, uh, give a job to some uh, revolutionary figure's nephew or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because if I do and my name's on the good list and then the counter-revolution happens, then I'll be lined up against the wall with all, all the revolutionaries. No, they, yeah. So therefore, people were expecting that the revolution was running out of gas out of enthusiasm, it wasn't delivering. Uh -huh. And, of course, when that happens, that's the dangerous moment in a revolution, uh -huh. because the radicals say the trouble with a revolution is it's not radical enough. Uh -huh. 
and then they try to take it over and to radicalize it. And that, of course, is exactly uh, what Mr. Carter made, enabled them to do by admitting the Shah to the United States. And we did not, on our part, have a sufficient understanding of the, of the radical cause, as it were, or the depths of the revolution that was taking place there, or be able to identify with the legitimate aspirations of that revolution that was Yes, occurred. we couldn't think like revolutionaries. We couldn't think like revolutions or like people other than the way we see the world. Again, back to that normal, that theme that you introduced at the Again. beginning of the interview. And Mr. Brzezinski, who was the... Uh, myopic. Uh, myopic <laughs> fellow. I mean, mm. he tends to see everything the way a Pole sees the Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, but Mr. Brzezinski asking over the telephone to the ambassador, why can't the army intervene to support the Shah? Just no recognition of the fact the Shah was, was, had failed. Mm. His mandate from heaven, to use a Chinese rather than a Middle Eastern expression, had been removed. Mm. And he was on his way out. Uh, the army was falling apart. Uh, had we, uh, perhaps a long time before, used the agency, the CIA, as a way of staying in touch with the revolution, which is after all why you have an, an, a covert organization mm -hmm. to cover yourself. To keep uh, in touch with the realities of only the realities, real politics. Whether or not they're well. realities, mm -hmm. at least when a revolution happens, you want, uh, you want uh, to be sure that uh, whoever is on first, whoever ends up on top is your friend. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of our cap leaders of the of our captors saying, uh, I mean, you Americans see only the elite. Uh, you were true. Tends to too be true. often. Too often. Huh? Too often the case. And oh yes, they have periodic campaigns in the foreign service to have a youth committee, mm -hmm. so we see younger people. But it's not. You tend to deal with the people that are going to be good for you, mm -hmm. or the more obvious opposition. But when. You had a country, a government in Iran under the Shah's administration, that literally forbade the embassy mm. to deal with the, with the to have any dealings with the opposition. And when we were so beholden to the Shah for all the things we hoped he'd do for us, uh, that we accepted that constriction, uh, constraint on our activity. Then what happens? We saw the Iran through the eyes of the Shah. Mm. And when the revolution came along, even though individual embassy offices have been predicting this since 1977, nobody dared put it in writing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You didn't. Nobody who writes a book want, or a, a newspaper article or, or sends an, in an embassy report wants to say something that's so far out that people are going to think they're crazy. Mm. And so it took until November of 79 before the embassy finally... Uh, 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 averted to the possibility that the Shah might not last, and that's only after the Shah brought it up himself. So it bespeaks an inability of the United States to be able to be functioning well in terms of, uh, particularly in situations which there is a, as you put it, revolutionary activity, or to be able to identify perhaps in a historical sense with the, the aspirations of a good number of the, what, underclasses or the people sure. who have aspirations other than those who are in an elite position within the countries of the world. And of that's course. a dangerous position for the United States to be in. As a, had a, if a man you know, from Mars was sort of down there, you know. uh, uh, E.T. was in there looking at the, at the, the situation mm -hmm. uh, and s had seen these vast gaps between the very rich and the very, the growing gap between the very rich and the very poor, an inability to... Uh, under the Shah's re in the Shah's regime to distribute, uh, to have the wealth percolate down uh, far enough. The offense given to Islamic feelings, which is very, are very, very egalitarian. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, as I say, the corruption manifest, the inefficiency of the government, and worst of all, and this is something we have a difficulty understanding, the difference between westernization and modernization. Yeah, this yeah. is a theme, of course, that runs through my book. But we don't, uh, when we, when uh, the regular economic counselor out there said, I think that the Iranians are going to welcome back the Americans and the American and a large American business community because they want modern technology. Mm -hmm. Well, sure, they want IBM mm -hmm. uh, computers and they want. Um, spare parts and they want air, uh, Boeing 747s and all that. But what they don't want is the kind of objective westernized society that we've created. Mm -hmm. uh, 
where Indeed, religion... much of the revolution that was going on in Iran was directed against those values exactly. Against mm -hmm. those values. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we assumed that those values were good. Mm -hmm. Why are they good? Because they are the values of America, the world's greatest nation. What's wrong with them? And again, it's that attitude that we have in the world that is causing us so much trouble in the world. Constantly. Mm -hmm. And now, some people may argue philosophically and on the basis of sociological data, mm -hmm. it's impossible to separate out westernization and modernization. If you're going to have a factory, then everybody has to get to work on at the same time or else the factory won't, for the same shift, or else the factory won't operate. But it is possible to have technologies within the culture and a different culture and a different view of things be able to bring benefits and still maintain the value of those Somewhat cultural different. traditions. different, and I spoke to a group of IBM executives about that, and I said, isn't it possible that you can, uh, that you can uh, design uh, uh, technology that doesn't fit American cultural expectations? They said, of course, we're sensitive to that. I remember I bought a uh, my kids in, uh, in 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 Beirut in 1969. I bought a a TV which they could operate, mm -hmm. and it was made in Mecca for Meccans. Yeah. And there was I think two buttons, yeah. uh, loud and soft, and on and off. Yeah. And uh, maybe you could shift uh, stations. You could do that. Yeah. But uh, but nothing else. Yes. And it was absolutely rudimentary, uh, simple. And it worked fine. Well, once again, the I remember our student guard saying, You're, you foisted a lot of inappropriate technology on us. Mm -hmm. uh, the Shah was building factories for which the Iranians were not capable of uh -huh. operating. Uh -huh. uh, they imported Koreans to help run their factories. Some of my guards spoke a little Korean mm -hmm. because they had been dealing with Koreans uh, the Iranians were at that point mm -hmm. where they could operate this highly sophisticated equipment. The Iranians are very good at some things. They're marvelous doctors, and they're not very good at other things. And uh, this was a problem. Again, this insensitivity, and of course, compounded by the fact that we said, well, that's what the Shah wants. Mm -hmm. And after mm -hmm. all, he's the ruler. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the problems we have is that we can't distinguish, we can't pierce the veil between the governed, between the government and the governed, uh -huh. uh, we can't deal with re with revolutionary governments when we recognize at re revolutionary groups when we recognize the government. Uh -huh. And if the Shah said he wanted it, who were we to say you shouldn't have it? Yes, right. Or even identify with that, or identify with the the ability of us to get out of, in a certain sense, it can be seen without being overblown in that direction, out of a myopic view of the world is a problem that is go, runs throughout your book, both within the Foreign Service and the nation as a whole, and mm -hmm. it's a question that's of major importance in terms as we begin to look ahead to a world which is obviously going to have to be able to understand the nations and the peoples of the nations of the world, understand themselves better and be able to put their themselves in the position of the other person and so forth. Sure. It's a major theme and a major problem that confronts us and we have problems that continue as we as we, as, as we as we go from time from the time of your captivity on into the to the present time, and has led to a situation which is worrisome, to say the, to the very least, at the contemporary moment. I'd like to come back in a minute, if we could. We'll just take a little break here and come back and talk in a second section about the uh, about some of the further dimensions, if you don't mind, and uh, because the the dimension, the, the implications of it are very, 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 very important as we begin to look ahead. So, if you stay tuned, we'll be coming right back with more with Morehead Kennedy. He is again, of course, the author of the Ayatollah in the Cathedral, recently published uh, book uh, with his experience, and he was one of the uh, hostages, of course, in the in 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 Iran uh, uh, some time back. So we'll be coming right back. Please stay tuned. Back again now with uh, Morehead Kennedy, who is, of course, the uh, one of the uh, hostages in the in, in Iran, and again has written this uh, very interesting book, The Ayatollah in the Cathedral. And again, to continue with our conversation, you you were you had an incredible experience having been one of the hostages in the uh, in in uh, in Iran, and that experience itself is probably tried and overworked, and you've probably heard it a million times, but it had a way of focusing the mind and altering mm -hmm. your view. You had uh, prior to that and continue to have uh, uh, and coming out of that experience a view in terms of let's say the Arab uh, 
cause or the Arab side or the Arab view of things, uh, one that many people who tend to see things all black and white and that we're all right and that their view is all wrong and that sort of thing. You have a unique position or a, a different kind of view of things than a good deal of your colleagues and of the general society here in the United States. I think I was certainly more open to uh, Middle Eastern views and values and understanding. I had been a student of it. I was interested in it. Uh, and I think that uh, was something I took with me into captivity. Mm -hmm. But I think where captivity changed things for me was simply this. Uh, our view of the Middle East, or indeed of the developing world, of Latin America or whatever, is still very imperialist. Mm -hmm. uh, we assume, because we have the might and the military, economic muscle, the technology, and we are, after all, a very advanced, successful mm -hmm. civilization. Now, we're on top, and that very much c colors your perspective. You're mm -hmm. looking down, mm -hmm. and they're looking up. Mm -hmm. Neither side wants to admit it, at least of all them. Uh, but the Orientalist approach, the approach of the cultural imperialist, was, I think, uh, drilled into us. And for the first time in my life, there I was beholden depending dependent for my life on the goodwill of my captors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were in charge now i didn't i don't think we lost dignity we hostages mm -hmm. i don't think we were too collaborationist at least with very few exceptions uh i think most of us pursued a sensible middle ground of going along with the situation not being overly nice and not being overly not making life overly dif dif difficult. But mm -hmm. the point is, you, we were still powerless. Mm -hmm. And having been in that situation, then coming out of it, and looking back on the Middle East, where I was ruled by the Middle East, yeah. the way they've been ruled by the West, yeah. that does change your perspective just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we recognize and somehow find ways to um, bring into our school curriculums and other ways of educating the young and middle-aged and the old, mm -hmm. that... Uh, it's that they look at the world very differently and that uh, they pay a great deal of attention to us and they watch us very carefully yeah, much more than we is do so pervasive and it's our so values pervasive. are so pervasive just in the technology and so forth perhaps we're not adequately aware of what that means to people who have a rich culture or tradition of their own that they're yeah. aligned well, with even yeah. our our canadian friends have problems with the uh, this intrusive and all pervasive american culture yeah which means that uh, uh, Canadian books are grouped in one little corner of a bookstore called uh -huh. Canadiana. Yeah. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, you find uh, the same thing. The books that are, you see, uh, you read the Arabic, and it's just a translation. Uh -huh. uh, of course, they have vital societies of their own. They produce a lot of things. But still in all, our, our culture, our TV, our the movie Dallas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the TV series, uh, pervades. Yeah. And so people find themselves defining themselves in our terms mm -hmm. and not in theirs. And so there was a great deal of anxiety about who am I? Yeah. Uh, and the Shah fed that by trying to turn his country into an outpost of the West. Yeah. And a great many Iranians felt we can never be Westerners. And if we try to be Westerners, we're going to be second-class Westerners, second-class Americans. And therefore, we, we're left with nothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the reaction against the Shah was, fell very naturally into the hands of a group that had always been the upholders not only of, of religion, but of the Iranian personality, the national personality, and that was, of course, the mullahs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they were the one opposition group the Shah could never totally eradicate and then and this is the irony of the whole thing mm -hmm. this was a revolution designed to expunge from Iran Western influences where they were of cultural significance mm -hmm. but the revolution itself uh, was made possible in part by Western technology yeah. and there was uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini mm -hmm. in uh, Iran in uh, Paris taping his sermons on cassettes, and they were transmitted by direct dial telephone, of which the mm. Shah was very proud, yes. which meant no human being intervened. He couldn't cut them off. Put in there by American companies. Put in there right. by GTE and AT ATT. Right. Uh, and the, they were the means by which the uh, imam's words reached 
every mosque in, in Tehran. Yeah. So here was the Shah hoisted by his own telecommunications. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I see. Yeah, and again, back to the theme that the telecommunications or technology in general could be or can technology and let's say the advantages of a technological mm -hmm. system be integrated into a, a pattern that holds and withhold and gives traditional mm -hmm. values their due, due respect and in the eyes of many in the world the the imperialism or the, the, the thrust of Western culture, American culture, both culturally and now even militarily in mm -hmm. many increasing instances and so forth, uh, is creating a situation in terms of international politics which does not as it could be projected necessarily bode well for the image or the the feelings toward the United States and let's say the developing world in general. It's right. a problem. So it's an indeed a very very serious problem and one we're not sufficiently aware of. Uh -huh. I think too that um, as I look back on my on my experience it was a, this uh, one of the things that stands out is this ambivalence of the uh, of the third world is represented by these young Iranians mm -hmm. towards the United States. Yeah. Tremendous admiration for what we'd been able to achieve. I remember uh, Hossein Sheikh al Islam, the uh, present day deputy foreign minister, in those days s senior spokesman for, the, for our captors, telling us about the restrictions on Iranian students and repressive measures, as he called them, against Iranian students in the United States. And he said there was a move to expel them all. Mm -hmm. And he had been one himself at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, but, he, but he said, no, they did not expel them, but they began to crack down on those whose visas and immigration papers were not in order mm -hmm. and expel those who were not. And they said that was discriminatory mm. because they didn't do that to other foreign students. Uh -huh. Now, here was our captor. Here was uh, Hossein Sheikh al-Islam, uh, bitterly anti-American in some ways, uh, and still is, appealing to an American norm, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. he had learned at California, yes, right. which was uh, equal protection of the laws, yes, right. uh, uh, non-discrimination, which is an important value for us, so where everybody's treated the same, mm -hmm. uh, appealing to that in order to protest uh, action uh, which was not very onerous, mm -hmm. against young Iranians who themselves were in violation of the law, mm -hmm. when he himself uh, was holding us captive. <laughs> and I really yes, thought this yes. was an example of the pervasiveness of uh, American culture, uh, which was uh, uh, something, again, that they, that they resent and, uh, and at the same time are also... Uh, uh, they resent and admire at the same time. Yeah, given, given the thrust and the power of the United States, both culturally, again, politically, and so forth, uh, and, and, and given the the, the, di the the different cultural views and national values and so forth there are, back to this theme again of uh, dealing, let's say, from the position of the United States, that we really it's incumbent upon us within the United States, both the leadership in the Foreign Service and other aspects of the government and the general society, to try and break out of our chauvinism, if that's mm -hmm. the right expression, try yeah. to get a world view that can take into account the thinkings of other people as somehow being valid and to break out of that, and that that's a, a major problem that we have, that we tend to see things black and white. I wonder if you could pick up on that As a project, and bring it up into the modern experience. Or the, the, uh, how the do you do it? Well, I mean, yes, your real question, your real question is all very nice to say. Let's uh, encourage the American people to stop projecting their own uh, views abroad as if they were of universal validity. Mm -hmm. uh, let's try and, and help and insist that Americans begin to think uh, has put themselves in the position of being Swiss or, or uh, uh, Congolese or, or whatever, whatever. How are you going to do it? Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully, you know, uh, on the theory that out of every bad thing, something good's going to come, that terrorism is going to be a reminder uh, after it goes through its first shock period, which we're in now, uh, that people will outgrow the idea these are just terrible people mm -hmm. and to say to themselves, well, what is it they've got against us? Yeah. What are they, um, these, former, there, yeah. these former students in the United States, what are they protesting so much about? Why are they attacking us? And if that question begins to be asked, uh, this is not a demeaning question, it's not self-denigrating, to say, where have we gone wrong? Yes. Where have we made our mistake? To the extent that that question begins to percolate into the American consciousness, then maybe a move can be made um, well, perhaps we should start listening to them. Mm -hmm. 
Now, people have asked, well, about the book, why aren't you coming out with a series of concrete policy recommendations that will end terrorism? Well, I've got quite a few, I think. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, uh, responding to terrorism by knocking terrorists over the head, knocking other governments over the head, or bombing civilian tar targets, or as whatever, we did in Libya. as we did in Libya, as we did in uh, in uh, Lebanon, uh, when we shelled Lebanese villages. Indeed, uh, all these things. Uh, up to a certain point, you can uh, uh, slow ter the growth of terrorism activity and terrorist activity down, but it's no final solution. Ultimately, only when we go through a certain change of attitude uh, is are, are we going to be able to relate to this part of the world and to see the kind of festering sores that are generating terrorists. It might be a little discomforting to realize that some of these problems as they are being manifest around the world are the result of our own attitudes and policies in the world and people do not like to see the world that way. They like to see themselves as all good. and that They don't the like the thought, and I've put this in the book, that the, mm -hmm. t the terrorists are holding up a mirror mm -hmm. to us and we look in that mirror and uh, uh, we may not like what we see. Mm -hmm. And there are things about our society they don't like very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't like our sexual mores, mm -hmm. certainly that's the case, perfectly true. They don't like our materialist uh, approach, mm -hmm. our bottom line orientation. It doesn't mean that, that Arabs and Iranians aren't greedy like anybody else. But to make it a value mm -hmm. to the extent that we have yeah. is to them deep, deeply shocking. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, many things about our society they find is, is not, well, let's say, turn it around, it's not necessarily progress mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. far as they're concerned. But now, how are we going to encourage this growth? Um, I would like to see some changes in the American school system. Mm -hmm. One thing we're doing in the Council for International Understanding, which I direct yeah. and which is mentioned in the book, we've got a series of, of videotapes uh, where I am recounting some of my hostage experiences and then relating them, as we're doing right now, mm -hmm. uh, to, to American values, in one particular case, religious values, because the first set series is for use in, in churches, which are a wonderful way to educate uh, grown-ups, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as more, perhaps more appealing to the young, uh, we've got a, uh, we're working on a, uh, a computer simulation in which, uh, again, the students reenact the hostage uh, crisis. They have to make decisions. But if a student makes a decision when he's playing the role of an Iranian, mm -hmm. and he makes it the way an American would, uh, and that's going to be hard to, to computerize, but, uh, put on the software, but I think we can do it. If he does that, then the machine will say, tilt, hey fella, this isn't the way to, you can do it. Mm -hmm. But even more Im important to realize that once you commit yourself to a certain course of action abroad, it's very hard to back off. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to, for us to get out of Vietnam. It was, it very, was hard very hard to disengage from the Shah. Yes, indeed. And these are important things which I think, in terms of general sophistication, mm -hmm. our, our students have to learn. And we're also more and more important. There are a lot of small colleges, uh, in fact, a lot of universities, that have more students than they have dorm space. Mm -hmm. And one very good way to get to keep a large student body and not have to house it all at the same time is to send part of it abroad for a semester or an academic year. How about that idea of the young people going abroad and learning the culture? Do you generally think that that's a favorable thing, that there'd be inter-exchange? Well, you know, it depends on how you do it. Uh, I was in Chile, I noticed a lot of Chilean economists uh, had been trained at the University of Chicago, which was the, in those days the holy grail yeah. of uh, the monetarist yeah. economics, Friedman. And, and Friedman and Harberger yeah. and so yeah. forth. Yeah. But some of them came back barely able to speak English. Mm -hmm. They economics is a language of its own and they commuted from their the library to the, to the classroom. They don't think they learned a darn thing about the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, much better is a program I think we have that is has an ac academic in, ingredient and it's called the Partnership for Service Learning mm -hmm. where they work, uh, they have courses on the side but essentially they're working in a hospital or a, or a home for autistic children or, or yeah. something like that or, or some other program where they're involved with people. Sort of like the Friends thing also, they uh, have that, or Friends uh, They have. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the, the beauty of this program is that it, they get academic credit for it because uh -huh. the journal they keep uh, working in, the, uh, in these very foreign environments, when you work with somebody mm -hmm. and 
who lets who f through the door first? Yeah. Uh, can you walk into somebody's office any time? Mm -hmm. These are little cultural norms that you have to pick up, and they open your eyes to the fact that people behave and think differently. All those things recorded in their journal becomes their term paper. Yeah, okay. And so we think this is a very good way uh, to, at a key point in people's, young people's lives, when they're, form when they're before they get completely hidebound, uh -huh. uh, to have a set part of their university training overseas. Yeah, that would be fine. We could start breaking down some of the cultural, or allowing them to open up to, you know, other cultural values and so forth, particularly for the young people, educational and some of our religious institutions could be well utilized as educational institutions as well. Yes, take a year off and work with uh, uh, people in, in Africa, Peace yeah. Corps activities. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's for academic credit, it just saves you a little time, that's mm -hmm. all. In general, I wonder, do you feel it is that the United States has a foreign policy initiative that we had? We did have back in the 60s. We had a Peace Corps. We had young people idealistically going out mm -hmm. and relating in a certain sense to the the best able they're able to do to the to the people of the, the you know mm -hmm. the underclasses as it were of the world and in general our foreign policy initiatives have a lack of having a a vision to a future alternative future for the underclasses of the world that gives an opening upon a future uh, altered condition that is in respondent accord with let's say revolutionary or, or, or revolutionary tending ideologies which is part of the third world's milieu and that's a problem the United States doesn't have I think we have a real problem view. and the problem was the future yes a quick look at American history up mm -hmm. till 1860 Americans instinctively sympathized with revolutionary with, with uh, revolutionary governments mm -hmm. uh, Kusseth in Hungary yeah. uh, after 1860 and don't forget during the Civil War the, the Tsar of Russia sent his fleets to New York and San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, Americans became, America became an empire. Mm -hmm. And we suppressed a rebellion called the Confederacy. Yeah. Well, and at that point, at that point, the American mindset shifted and we became imperialist. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, we've got to be reminded, and maybe terrorism will help us do it, and these educational programs, uh, that that mind shift in 1860 is no longer a very good one. And we've got to go back to the where we were before 1860 uh, to put ourselves, as we were then, uh, a small nation, we've got to put ourselves in that mindset. What's it really like to be a Tunisian? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And to have a little more sympathy for these people, because if we don't, if we don't listen, if we don't understand, they're finding ways to hit us terrorism will spread over here. Well, and terrorism's a many-sided thing in an instance, too, because, I mean, yeah. the raid on terror on Libya has been called terrorist, state terrorism, on the part of the United States. Terrorism is a moral one nightmare. Person's, one yeah. person terrorism is another person's freedom fighters and this kind of thing. And the, the, the point is really that we have to understand one another better somehow, and on the part of the United States is particularly incumbent upon us because we've become too often, or so chauvinistic as a word for viewing, viewing the world outward I think with part, this tremendous power that we do have. You're so right, and I think part of, our, of this uh, rethinking, which I hope will come from the young, but uh, from, from all ages, is to rethink our, some of these moral issues. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have uh, Mr. Reagan saying uh, he would not negotiate with those who shoot 11-year-old uh, girls. Mm -hmm. This was, of course, that tragedy at the air airport in, in Europe. At the same time, the USS New Jersey shelled Lebanese villages and killed plenty of 11-year-old girls. Indeed. Now, uh, I don't think enough Americans are aware, uh, without debating this angels in the head of a pin mm -hmm. moral question, yeah. uh, and a lot of that debate is pretty sterile, let's just look at it practically. How would you feel if you were Lebanese? Mm -hmm. yeah. How would you feel if you saw your family mm -hmm. being blown to bits by American guns and then it being uh, excused in terms of, uh, in the language of Secretary Schultz, well, after all, we've, uh, we've got to take, we might have to take a few innocent lives. Yeah, right, right, yeah, that's right. Now, right. this doesn't sound very good if you're uh, at that end. Do you think that the direction of, of, of policy initiatives that involve uh, the military reflects the fact that we are, in a certain sense, have sterile in terms of alternate foreign policy positions the United States could take that would strike a respondent chord within the peoples of the world? That's a very good question. I think the word sterile. In the first place, we don't have the right equipment. Mm -hmm. We are... Uh, forced into military activity when, military activity when, when what you need is 
or to, to combat terrorism, mm -hmm. which you need a small, highly trained hit teams to go in and take out terrorist targets. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't trained those. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're trained for the big war. Mm -hmm. And our military have been very much dragging their feet. They don't want to be sucked into this kind of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, we're not morally equipped for it. We don't, I have said on, on the television and other places, and I have no objection to selective, uh, selective assassination of terrorist leaders. Oh, people say, how can you say that? Uh, but after all, they're going to assassinate us. Mm. Uh, I, th I think that if you prevent the loss of innocent lives, that's very well taken. But the same people who are totally shocked at the idea of, of uh, getting, of inf infiltrating, uh, working with other terrorists, playing one terrorist group against another, uh, the, our own paramilitary activities against terrorists, who are shocked at that. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that turn a very deaf ear to the political arguments made by the terrorists, to their causes, and they won't listen. What about, what about the idea of being able to diffuse, as it were, in a certain sense, these acts of terrorism, as it were, from those on the other side, as you might see them by, in a certain sense, rather than, let's say, a military response, or even an assassination, as you indicate, would be a... Mm -hmm. I think that would be uh, some people considering this, uh, uh, the, a, a, an attitude on the part of the United States or let's say the West to, 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 to consider some of the issues that are being raised by people who are doing activities rather than seeing it in black and white terms. I mean, right. Uh, what I would like to a see... Policy, a, a negotiating stance and an attitude that would make it possible for there to be talk that could be actually beneficial toward getting at some of the root solutions or the root problems there are that of create course. the... Uh, the tension. Well, you know, one hears this all the time. Yes, I was sure. Uh, yeah. we, we, have, we have great understanding of some of the political uh, grievances and, and causes that motivate the terrorists, but we do not accept the means he, use. mm -hmm. he uses. Well, that's all very well to say. Do we have an understanding but of it? Do mm -hmm. we have an understanding and are we prepared to act on it? Mm -hmm. Are we prepared to uh, resuscitate the peace process? Mm -hmm. Are we prepared to fulfill the unfulfilled... Uh, agenda of Camp David. Mm -hmm. uh, remember the Egyptians in a sense sold out the Palestinians in order to, to, to strike a deal with Menachem Begin, mm -hmm. who then turned around and continued the settlement of the West Bank and all the things he yeah, promised not to. In their view, it continues. It continues. Yeah. Now, are we willing to do that? And if not, then what other means do they have to keep their cause alive? Do you take any? Do you take any? Do you take any um, uh, value, or what value do you give to such institutions as the United Nations and the International Court of Justice and other international institutions that might be able to help arbitrate between the national uh, forces as they're being seen? So well, I think that we're in a period now when the United Nations is not very well thought of within the, the this administration, mm -hmm. and they say, well, we're always being outvoted. Uh, and the third world is always voting for the Soviets against us, and there we are, uh, isolated with the, perhaps the Israelis and the South Koreans or whatever. Yeah, and we uh, are increasingly isolated uh, in terms of the broader world. Increasingly isolated, and my answer to that is, you're confounding cause and effect. Mm -hmm. It's not the United Nations fault that we're being outvoted, it's simply that we've lost our capacity to lead uh, the third world. It's very disquieting. It's right. very disquieting. For power, it, not to have a vision that can ring, as it were, with the peoples of the world. The Gene Kirkpatricks of this world argue, and I think with all the logic of that very intelligent woman can muster, she argues that everybody's out of step but Johnny. Mm -hmm. In other words, that we're right and everybody's against us, we must, they must be necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the case. What I think is happening is that the Soviets, very cynically, are able to play the third world vote against us. But at the same time, we don't show in some of the causes that we espouse, uh, uh, and I'm afraid Israel has put itself in that position with regard to the rest of the third world, mm -hmm. and South Africa are identified very much in the minds of a lot of third world countries together, that we don't show a... Uh, it's one thing to be supportive of Israel, and I certainly am, but it's quite something else to say that it, it's only the... Only, we'll only listen to the Israelis. Mm -hmm. And it's a, quite something else to say uh, we're not about to press for the kind of justice for the Palestinians that we would demand for ourselves. All right, okay. And these are issues that go to the core of the problems that exist between us, and they're, 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 they're important, and they're, they're, they're difficult questions, and they're questions that you've pondered over a long and distinguished career, which I thank you for and congratulate you on, and for all of your work. And I want to congratulate you specifically on having written this um, 
you know, this really very, very interesting the book that goes right to the core of many of these kind of questions. Again, I'd like to remind the audience in the, uh, of the title and so forth, The Ayatollah in the Cathedral, and uh, bespeaks of the attitude to try and find absolute questions in an era of uncertainty, which is one of the problems that we have, uh, that we, we live in a time of uncertainty, a time of transition, and an extremely interesting, uh, an interesting subject area. We could go on talking for hours with you about these. We only touched on a number of these themes, but I want to congratulate you on all of your work, right, and to wish you all the best in this educational task that you've set for yourself as we begin to move ahead. So thank you, and I think if the audience wants to find out any more, they they might like to read my book. Absolutely. We'd like to recommend <laughs> that to them as well, right? I would remind you, I'm sorry we've run out of time for this particular program, but I would like to remind you again in the table television audience, it's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of Moorhead Kennedy, again, the author of the book, and, of course, uh, one of those who went through experiences that uh, uh, focused the mind tremendously in terms of opening upon different views of the world, and we might be all able to benefit, particularly here in the United States, we may be able to benefit from the lessons that he has learned and has helped uh, bring into the broader society in terms of American attitude in, 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 in the world that might need re-examination. I thank you for all of that. Uh, sorry we've run out of time. We'll be coming back again next week. Mr. Warhead Kennedy, thank you once again. Good. Good night. We'll see you next week.